welcome to the Pasco Community Baptist Church. We're so glad that you are able to join us this evening uh, for our special Wednesday service. Uh, uh, it's a Wednesday service we hold during Passion Week where we uh, put the emphasis upon the cross and what Jesus did for us upon the cross. And so everything this evening will have to do with that subject. The songs, the scriptures, everything, including the preaching, will have something to do with the cross. And so that's our theme uh, for uh, this evening. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to have this time where we can take a few moments to sing praises to you concerning the wonderful work that you did on our behalf on the cross. We also thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we'll have to look into the pages of your word and learn more about what you did for us there at Calvary that day. And so bless our time together. We pray that you'd speak to each one of our hearts, those that are gathered here in church this evening, as well as those that are watching by way of the internet. Speak to us tonight through the work of your Holy Spirit. And may Jesus, our Savior, be glorified and praised and honored. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with a scripture passage. I have uh, several scripture passages I want to read to you this evening. The, the, the first two passages are prophecies from the Old Testament concerning uh, the work of Christ on the cross. The first one was written by David, King David, a thousand years before the cross ever happened. And what's interesting is that there's a description of crucifixion here in Psalm 22. But this was written before crucifixion was ever used as a form of capital punishment. And yet here it is described for us as a prophecy concerning Christ. So I'm going to read to you a portion of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season and am not silent. But thou art holy, O oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered, and trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he, art he that took me out of the womb, Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have increased me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare at me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. We'll see a number of those things as we look into the New Testament fulfillment of this passage in just a little bit. But before we read any further scripture, uh, we're going to sing a song about the cross, a famous old hymn. We're going to sing the old rugged cross. And so I'll ask you to stand and we'll sing the old rugged cross. Thank you. 
another passage of scripture, again, a prophecy from the Old Testament concerning uh, the crucifixion. And it's taken this time from a more familiar passage to us, which is Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, this one being written about 600 years uh, before it actually was fulfilled. So I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For she shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken, and made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Uh, when thou shalt uh, make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he, became, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. At this time, we're going to sing another song about the cross. This one is actually titled, At the cross. And so again, we'll stand and we'll sing, and then we'll read one more passage of Scripture this evening.
switch over to a New Testament passage where we actually see the fulfillment of the verses that we have just read. So we're going to read John's account of the crucifixion from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John chapter 19, and we will begin reading in verse 16. Once you turn there, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Then delivered he him. The he is Pilate in this passage, and the him is Jesus. Then delivered uh, Pilate, uh, uh, Jesus, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now in uh, Luke's account, it's called Calvary. Uh, Golgotha is the Hebrew uh, phrase for the place of a skull. Calvary is the Latin phrase for the place of a skull. Where, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate uh, wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, and we read this in Psalm 22, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. Of these things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, therefore, stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, and of course that was the apostle John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour his disciples took his, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might, both, might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon his lip and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up. Before I preach a little bit this evening on the subject of the cross, you saw in that passage about Jesus being the one in the middle, the one in the middle. And I'm going to ask my daughter Kirsty to come and sing for us a song about the man in the middle.
broken heart that middle to the world as people passed by 
was reduced to, we preach. We preach. And just having those two words over the door, it was as if the church had no message. Uh, the church was merely a lecture hall. And, and that's why I said I hope that uh, the story is just a parable. Because the truth is, if any essential part of the message of the Christian gospel is neglected, then Christianity loses its power. And at the same time, the message is no longer the gospel as revealed in Jesus. And this is what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote these words in Galatians chapter 6. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. It's been said that nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down, down to size, that is, like the cross. Because it's at the foot of the cross of Calvary that we shrink to our true size. It's there that our delusions of self-righteousness are shattered. Because we see ourselves as we really are, as sinners before a holy God. And so we have to ask the question, why the cross? Why did Paul say that he could never boast of anything except the cross of Jesus? Well, the context of Paul's words is his concern that the Christian believers to whom he wrote were in danger of being seduced by false teachers into abandoning the simplicity of faith in Jesus as their Savior, of this Jesus who had died on the cross. And what happened to the Christians in Galatia can easily be repeated in the 21st century uh, because the evil one is just as anxious to divert people away from the truth of the gospel as he was in the first century. And human nature hasn't changed in the, in the passing of years. So let's think for a moment of what could sidetrack people from the priority of boasting only in the cross of Christ. When I thought about that this week, the first thing that came to my mind was this. The ethical teaching of Jesus. Now his teaching, of course, is wonderful. It's the, the highest standard of morality uh, given to humanity. But there are many people who aren't Christians who praise the ethical teachings of Jesus, like, like are found in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, they like Jesus, the teacher. They say that his teaching is the very thing the world needs, and that's, that's certainly true. And their theory is that if everyone practiced it, all our problems would be solved. But I remember hearing a prominent politician being interviewed on a religious TV show as he told the interviewer that he believed in the ethical teachings of Jesus which fitted in with his brand of social ideas, but he had no use for the Christian view of the atonement on the cross that was made by Christ. He said it, it was not, it's what you did with the ethical teachings of Jesus that mattered. And it was not his death that was important. And can I tell you this? Paul would disagree. Paul would disagree. Now it's true that the world would be a great deal better if the teaching of Jesus was uh, put into practice. But what did Paul say about that? Why didn't the Apostle Paul say, God forbid that I should glory save in the Sermon on the Mount? Or why, why didn't he say, God forbid that I should glory save in the Golden Rule? Or why did he say, uh, God forbid that I should glory save in the incomparable teaching 
of the Son of God. It's because Paul knew that teaching alone, even from the lips of Jesus, was not sufficient. You see, there is all the difference in the world between praising the Sermon on the Mount and practicing it. We, we applaud it. But to apply it is a different matter. You see, in our better moments, we may, we may want to live according to its standard, but because we're fallen beings, we are powerless to do so. And Paul knew all about this when he wrote to the Christians at Rome, in Romans 7, uh, 23, he, he talked about the law that worked in his body and, and that warred against the law of his mind and brought him into captivity to the law of sin, causing him to cry out in the next verse, in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You see, the, the real meaning of the Sermon on the Mount for, for the world today is not... Live like this, and you will become a Christian. In fact, like the Ten Commandments, and like the life of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is, is designed to show us that we can't, in our own strength, live that way. Paul knew that it wasn't just the teachings of Jesus, but it was the power of God in his life that would rescue him. As he put it in the next verse, in verse 25 of Romans 7, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus himself is the answer, not just his teachings. And so it's no wonder that he exclaims, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what is it? What is it about the cross which is so important and so vital? Well, of course, the cross is the symbol of Christianity. It's the focal point of church architecture. If we were to uh, lift the, the screen here, you'd see that I have a cross right behind me here, right? It's the, it's the focal point of church architecture. It's also worn as an ornament at the end of a, a gold chain by many people. But that's only a picture of the reality. Uh, these uh, symbols are things of beauty, the, the stained wooden cross, the, the precious uh, metal. But the cross of Jesus was just the opposite. The scene on Calvary was a dreadful one. It was a place of torture. Think of how the Roman soldiers, having previously beaten Jesus, then mocked him and placed a crown of thorn on his head and then nailed him to a rough cross beam of wood, dropped it into a hole in the ground with a thud, causing unimaginable pain. So why the cross? Why the cross? Well, it's because the message of the Bible is that the cross is God's means of salvation to sinful mankind. And to many people, this all sounds very morbid. And they think, what difference can it make to us now, in, in, in this century, that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified 2,000 years ago? See, to many people... That is, you know, uh, many people taken up with living busy and, fruit and fulfilled lives. The cross is more or less meaningless. At best, it was no more than a noble act of martyrdom or a fine example of devotion to duty. At worst, it was a bad mistake, a, a terrible miscarriage of justice. But in any case, it's something that never ought to have happened, like, like all the great tragedies. Of history. So what do we say to that? Has the cross no particular meaning for us today? 
Is it only an example of self-sacrifice which uh, we should try to copy? Well, the Apostle Paul would say resounding no. The death of Jesus on the cross was not an accident. It wasn't the greatest tragedy of all time, nor uh, was it something to be imitated. It is the means of salvation. It's the only way by which you and I can be saved from God's righteous judgment. But how does the cross save us? How does the cross save us? Well, the answer is we have to see who it is that's on the cross. As Paul says here, uh, God forbid that I should glory save on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who looked at the ghastly, this ghastly spectacle of a man dying in agony on uh, that day, they saw him as just the man from their period of time. He was, uh, he was the carpenter of Nazareth, who at the age of 30 set out to be a preacher, but then he had a falling out with the religious establishment of his day who managed uh, to have him condemned as a political agitator. But who really is this man? Well, the testimony of Scripture, of course, is that he is the Lord. He is the Son of God. But if that's true, why did the eternal Son of God come from eternity into time and take on a human body. And more importantly, why did he die? Well, you know what? He answers that question in his own words. In Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Oh, yes, he died at the hands of wicked men, the, uh, the Jewish leaders who, who conspired against him, and the Roman soldiers who were the instruments of the crucifixion. But the cross was not an accident. It was God who had planned it. Uh, the, particular, the participants, rather, uh, in the drama of the cross were simply carrying out in time what God had predetermined before the foundation of the world. God knew that man was going to fall before he made him. And he had, a, 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 he had planned a way of salvation before man was ever created. Now, of course, the cross is a mystery. And it is beyond our full understanding. But it is an essential part of God's plan of redemption. And the Apostle Paul uh, saw this very Clearly, there could be only one reason why this most amazing spectacle the world has ever seen actually took place. It was because mankind needed so desperately to be redeemed. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, someone put it this way. Any man who thinks he deserves heaven is not a Christian. Because we don't deserve heaven. We are sinners. Humankind is a mixture of good and bad, moral and immoral, uh, but respectability uh, doesn't uh, count in the sight of God because under the veneer of morality and good works, we're still sinners. We're still sinners. Now, most people would agree with that, even if they would do so reluctantly. But then comes the question, why wouldn't God just forgive sin without the cross? Why can't a God of love, just like a good father, forgive a, a, a person who simply says he or she is sorry? without the cross, without the need of the cross. 
It's a good question. And the answer is that God is righteous. He's the lawgiver. He's holy. And he can't pretend that he hasn't seen sinful humanity. He, he can't turn a blind eye. He must punish sin. He must be just. And to do otherwise would compromise his holiness. So if sin is to be forgiven, it must be on some basis that is compatible with God's holy law. So here's the problem. On the one hand is the guilty sinner, and on the other is a holy God. So how can these two, the guilty sinner and the holy God, be brought together? The answer is the cross of Christ. The cross is the center of God's plan. It is the heart of God's way of saving the world. So again, it's no wonder that Paul exclaims, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the years of communist domination, in East Germany, there was a symbol that brought hope and comfort to believers in Jesus. A huge tower had been erected to broadcast atheistic propaganda. And near the top of the building was a globe-shaped structure housing a restaurant. And the remarkable thing was that the sunlight always reflected off that globe in the shape of a cross. In the shape of a cross. The authorities were embarrassed uh, and, and they tried everything they could think of to prevent this optical phenomenon, uh, even covering the dome with paint. But nothing worked. Nothing worked. And one East German pastor comment, commented on it saying this, no matter how hard they try, they can't get rid of the cross. And Paul would agree. And he would say, God forbid that we even try to get rid of the cross. Because the cross is the cross of redemption. It's the cross of atonement and remission of sins. It's the cross of reconciliation between God and man. In order to uh, make possible our salvation, God had to provide his own sacrifice. And it was his own son, the perfect Lamb of God. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 30, uh, 32, that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's what happened on the cross. God took your sins and my sins upon his beloved son. And the punishment that was, uh, that was our due was exacted on him. As the prophet Isaiah had announced 600 years before, we read it earlier, Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's a quotation that I love from Psalm 85, 10, which really tells it all. It says this, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. And it was only at the cross of Jesus that it could take place. The wages of sin were indeed death. But instead of the sinner, it was the Son of God who was the substitute lamb. Remember what John the Baptist called him in John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And this is how the apostle put it in Galatians chapter 1. Verse 4, he, in verse 3 talks about our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. 
What a scene. What a scene. I read recently of two friends who went to law school. One became a lawyer and eventually a judge. But the other squandered his life and became a thief and ended up in court. And you'll never guess who was sitting at the judge's bench that day when he appeared in court. It was his old friend. Well, of course, uh, uh, the one big question that filled the courtroom was what kind of sentence would he pass? And to everyone's surprise, the judge demanded the full penalty of the law for his old friend. But no sooner had he passed sentence when he stepped down from the bench and took off his robe, walked over to the place where his old friend stood and put his arm around him and said to the court officer, let it be recorded to death that not only have I passed sentence upon him, but I will pay all his debts. And in that moment, you know what happened? The judge became his redeemer. And that's just a faint picture of what God in Christ has done for you and me. And that's why the apostle gloried in the cross. It's in the cross that we're saved. Jesus took our punishment and our guilt and God's holy law was satisfied. And from that day to this, anyone and anyone who will come to him in repentance and faith, faith in the sacrifice made by Jesus on the cross, they will find forgiveness. It's as if we never sinned. Because God sees us through the merits of his son. And that's why Paul could so confidently write in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now this message of the cross to the world of Paul's day was inescapably offensive. To the Jew it was a stumbling block. It was a symbol of weakness and humiliation and defeat. The Greeks also had a, a problem with the cross. It offended their sense of reason. No sane person would believe that kind of a, a fable. As a matter of fact, a cartoon has been found on a wall in the ruins of ancient Rome showing how crazy the Christian message seemed to the people at that time. It's a caricature of Jesus' crucifixion, showing a man's body hanging on a cross, but the body has a head of a donkey. And next to it, there's a figure of a young man with his hands raised as if in worship, and underneath is the inscription, he worships his God. See, Christ and his followers were objects of, of derision, objects of ridicule. And they often still are. Because the world just doesn't get it. The world, a crucified God? It, it just defies all reason. The non-Christian says that God would never involve himself like that in the world. And right there, is the dividing line between death and life, heaven or hell, saved or lost. Belief in the work of Christ on the cross is what makes all the difference. And the choice to believe it or not is a choice that must be made individually by each person. Now, to us as believers, the cross of Christ is the message that God has called us to believe and to proclaim and to live out. Right? The cross is the center of it all. To those who will not believe on the cross of Christ, it is 
inescapably offensive. But to those who believe, it's powerfully effective. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, it is the power of God unto salvation. And having considered tonight all these things about the cross, I trust that we can all say, along with Paul, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the cross. Thank you for sending your son to die there in our place so we could be forgiven of our sin, so we could have eternal life, so we could have a home in heaven, so we could have a personal relationship with you and know peace and joy in our hearts. We are so grateful and so thankful for your provision for our salvation. And Lord, I know just, I know every person in this room this morning, in this evening, and I know that every person in this room has made uh, a profession of faith in Christ. They've trusted him as their Savior. But Lord, I pray that if there's someone who's watching by way of the internet tonight who has not taken that step of faith, They've never put their faith and trust in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They've never invited him into their heart to be their Savior. I pray that tonight they would take that step of faith and see it to be the most important decision they will ever make. Lord, I pray that tonight someone who's listening to this message will come to know Christ in a personal way. So thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to be together. And thank you again the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.